Hello, my name is Phyllis Korf, and I'm a partner in the New York office of Mayor Brown. We want to thank you for joining us this morning if you're in the U.S. and this afternoon if you're in Israel for our webinar on innovation and immunotherapy. We at Mayor Brown are proud to partner with the Nexus Israel and the American Friends of Hebrew University to bring you this program. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. Please keep yourself on mute throughout the program. If you have a question, please submit it through the chat function on your screen, and we'll try to leave time at the end for other questions. Our speakers today are Professor Yaakov, Kobe Nachmayas, and my partners, Vera Nakovic and Lisa Ferry. We're gonna begin with Professor Nachmayas, who will lay the groundwork for the discussion about COVID-19, what research and development is doing now, how therapeutics are advancing, and where are we on a vaccine. And then Vera and Lisa will discuss how intellectual property rights factor into these R&D efforts and some traps and pitfalls in entering into collaboration, joint ventures, and licensing agreements. Um, We'll begin with a few words from Professor Nachmayas. He is the founding director of the Grass Center for Bioengineering at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He's a magna cum laude graduate of the Technion and an adjunct faculty member at Harvard Medical School. Professor Nachmayas received an NIH Career Award the Rappaport Prize for Biomedical Sciences, the K Innovation Award, and the Rose Trees Trust Prize, and probably many more that would take up the entire session to describe. <laughs> He's a fellow of both the prestigious American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering and the Royal Society of Medicine. Professor, thank you for joining us and please begin. Thank you, Phyllis, and thank you, Lisa and Vera, for, um, for, for providing this incredible platform to talk about COVID-19 and, uh, and uh, uh, the innovation and, and the legality of, of, of treatment. So I want to uh, start taking a few minutes to talk about, about viruses in general, and then COVID-19 and efforts uh, very specifically. So viruses are small. We know that. How small? Well, you know, a human hair is about 70 microns. That's something you can actually see. 10 times smaller than that, we have bacteria, the germs, for example, the germs in our teeth. If we want to go to viruses, we are about 10 times or even more smaller than an actual bacteria. So the coronavirus, named because of its spike proteins that are covering it like a crown, is one of those viruses that are about 100 nanometer in size. Now, usually when we think about viruses, if we studied in high school, viruses are these things that get into the cells and then grow and blow it up. But coronaviruses is actually part of a family of viruses that don't do that. They get into the cells, change it, but then the cells make new viruses and doesn't blow up. There's a different mechanism of damage here, and it's basically based on the immune response. Now, Coronaviruses, you know, we now kind of hear more about them in the Western world, but they've been with us for the past 10,000 years. The specific beta subfamily that which this coronavirus belongs to, COVID-19, uh, has been around with us since 3000 BCE. Now, most of these viruses cause mild diseases like the common cold, but the SARS family, which seems to be coming from bats primarily, seem to be causing an acute respiratory syndrome 
both in upper and lower respiratory tract infection. That means all of your lungs get infected. And this is a major cause for concern. And we had outbreaks similar to this one, you know, with SARS 2002, 2004, MERS in 2012, and then the SARS-CoV-2, which is the newest generation of, of, this, of these viruses, has been with us since November 2019. Now, uh, there are many risk factors for this disease. Some of them you heard about. Obese patients are more likely to come with, with an acute respiratory, acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, and have a cytokine storm. Not only people that are obese, but also people that are dyslipidemic. People that have high level of sugar in their blood, so they're hyperglycemic, not only diabetic. And also people with asthma are more prone to, the, to have a severe form of the disease. What makes this incredibly worrying is the fact that, you know, the uh, brothers and sisters of this virus, for example, the SARS virus, um, had a long-term effect. So people that actually recovered from the SARS virus, uh, even 12 years after infection, were a lot more likely to suffer from diabetes, hyper hyperglycemia, and even new cardiac diseases. So this epidemic, this pandemic is going to be with us with symptoms, you know, in many years to come. This led many groups around the world, including mine, to look for new therapies that can potentially uh, uh, affect this virus. You know, we all heard about hydroxychloroquine, right? Hydroxychloroquine was one of those drugs that was developed for malaria, but at least in the lab, it was very, very effective against the virus. And it is still very effective against the virus in the lab. The problem is that this drug doesn't translate to, to clinical studies. It seems like it's, it's working in a different way in primary lung cells, in lung cells of the human body and in the human lungs. Uh, there are other drugs that can potentially interfere with the virus. And some of them we recently you know, discussed in the press. Statins have been discussed as a potential uh, therapy to reduce inflammation in the lungs. And my group has been primarily working on the fibroid family of drugs that can also lower the virus. And for example, one of the things you can see here is what you know, data that, that my group and other groups are seeing. Um, essentially drug repurposing. This is a molecule that has been available for, to, to treat this dyslipidemia. And you can see very, very nicely, it can completely shut down virus replication in the dish, in the lab. And we can combine it with retrospective data from the clinic to ask whether patients taking this drug are somewhat protected from a severe course of the disease. At least in Bezafibrate, it looks like they might be. So this is the beginning. It's a good indication that you might want to take this study this, this type of data to a clinical trial to figure out whether it works or not. In parallel, there are numerous groups around the world that work on a vaccine development. This is the end goal because vaccines can protect a significant part of the population and caregivers. Um, and there are different types of these vaccines. So virus vaccines are these family of vaccines that are essentially using an inactivated virus or an attenuated virus, allowing the body to create antibodies. And some of the Chinese vaccines that were developed early are part of that subfamily. Viral vector vaccines are slightly different. We're taking a small amount of the DNA of the virus, of the RNA of the virus, putting it into a different virus that doesn't cause infection and causing the body to generate viral proteins in excess to get an immune response. So the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, one that you heard about in the news, is one type of, one, this type of vaccine. And also the Russian vaccine seems to be, the Sputnik V is also this type of vaccine that is being developed. More modern vaccines are not using another virus. They're actually using just the genetic material, whether RNA or DNA, introduced in a liposome or a vesicle into the patient. And that genetic material causes this generation of new proteins that get a vaccine response. It's easier to make. 
And it seems like this is a new generation of vaccines. So companies like Moderna or, or BioNTech and Pfizer are developing this type of nucleic acid vaccines. And then the last family of vaccine is this protein-based vaccine. Essentially just getting the virus proteins produced in mass and then injected into the patient to generate this immune response. And it seems like Sanofi and GSK are going into that route. None of these companies are alone. There are dozens of efforts in each one of those categories throughout the world to generate new vaccines. Challenge is that usually it takes about 16 years to make vaccines. Um, <laughs> and we're trying to do that in about a year and a half. So uh, there are already vaccines in phase, in phase one, phase two, and phase three studies. And it's remarkable that we are there. It's really outstanding that we're there. And it's very, very fast. It's, it's, it's really, uh, I can't describe how fast it is in, in biotech development. Usually it takes decades. And we look at who is leading the race. Well, it depends, but it looks like Oxford, Moderna, BioNTech, and even the Russian vaccine seems to be, you know, er, some sort of earlier timelines and, and the ability to make large, large amounts of the vaccine. So we all hope that in 2021, this vaccine is going to become available. And this is where I'm done. So I, I promised something short and I hope this was short enough. Okay, Vera or Lisa, would you like to pick it up now? Um, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll start us out. So thank you very much, Professor. Um, I'm Lisa Ferry. Uh, I'm a partner at Mayor Brown. I'm the co-leader of our global IP group. Um, I'm also the co-leader of our life sciences industry group. And my practice is really at the intersection of these two, of IP and life sciences. I represent innovator biopharmaceutical companies in litigation, patent office proceedings, and transactions. Um, often I evaluate and identify opportunities and risks for clients operating in this life sciences space. Many of the companies that I'm working with um, are at the forefront of COVID-related research and development. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here today to discuss these, these issues with you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Vera Nakovic. I am a partner in Mayor Brown's intellectual property practice, and I am based in our Chicago office. I have a biochemistry background, and I'm a registered patent attorney. And I have a diverse legal practice focused on patent related matters for life science companies. So I deal with um, prosecution and strategy of patents um, in the US and how that relates around the globe. Also enforcement of patents before the um, United States Patent and Trademark Office, um, the Federal Trade Commission and district courts. And because of that, kind of patent strategy, procurement, and enforcement background. I do a lot of work on um, due diligence for transactional matters, such as licensing, joint collaborations, or mergers and acquisitions. And one thing that we see uh, from those types of transactions are certain types of reoccurring traps um, that seem to come up time and time again. And definitely we will come up in, in these COVID-19 related license agreements or joint ventures. And so that's kind of the basis of, of part of our presentation today. So thanks for having us. So, so Lisa, um, maybe you can tell us about the form that some of these um, arrangements are taking between big pharma and um, uh, biotech companies to, to mm -hmm. help develop these and um, uh, also the government response to any of this are mm -hmm. are there uh, are, are are there government sides to this mm -hmm. certainly thanks phyllis so of course i think we all have seen um in the news and as uh, professor mentioned there are so many collaborations 
um, going on right now in order to find a vaccine or treatment um, or even diagnostics related to COVID-19. We're seeing collaborations, uh, partnerships, joint ventures, um, all types of arrangements. Uh, but of course, none of these are really new. Our field in life sciences has been um, developing in this area for years. Uh, we find more and more collaborations between companies, whether it's large biopharmaceutical companies or large companies with startups. Uh, we find collaborations uh, certainly with the public sector, with governments, with foundations, let's say like uh, the Gates Foundation. So with the, with the advent of COVID, um, what we're seeing really is this is just accelerating um, this field really of collaboration. And, and a lot of that has come out of this idea that, that we're very interrelated global um, marketplace. And so many companies look to each other um, to share risks, to share resources, to share knowledge. And as we all become more interconnected, you see companies really um, using this mechanism to research, uh, develop, and commercialize, <clears throat> excuse me, commercialize products. Uh, and many of that and that flows from this idea that uh, no company really has the resources to be an expert in anything. So you find companies out there sharing um, some of the resources so that perhaps if you are a, a leader in um, manufacturing and commercialization or a, a leader in uh, clinical trials, you may partner with a, a drug developer that's at kind of the forefront of new development. So I think that's what we're seeing. Um, I, I think that uh, one, of the, one of the points coming out of this that many companies um, are highlighting is that COVID really is just accelerating this idea and that the thought is um, all of these mechanisms in place, whether it's like here in the US with Operation Warp Speed, um, or many of the um, uh, patent pooling organizations that are coming out of the UN or out of WIPO, the World um, Intellectual Property Organizations. I think we're all looking to those as being a jumping off point for other immunotherapy um, developments. So the, the hope is that all that we're learning through this um, response to coronavirus not only will bring about a vaccine hopefully and treatment but also lessons to be applied to cancer drugs and all other types of, of drugs especially in immunotherapy and the vaccine for instance HIV and other areas so uh, I, I think the hope is that we're really learning so much from that and we'll be able to use that uh, moving forward. Hmm. I, um, we had a question about the trade-offs between the speed at which some of these vaccines are are being um, discovered or you know created um, and their effectiveness and their or, or, and probably their their safety as well. Um, would would someone address that? And maybe we'll hear from. Professor Nachmayas on that as well. Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, I would love to hear the professor's thoughts on this. Um, I think certainly we're all seeing this, of course, and there's, there's concern about um, on one side of this, the speed to find something, there's this tremendous um, need to, to have this developed. Um, and at the same time, kind of the safety and all of that. And I think maybe a layer on top of that is just the idea of, you know, a lot of what we'll be speaking about today, kind of the intellectual property rights, whether that will in any way kind of hinder or prohibit um, the 
getting a vaccine or treatments out there around the globe um, to folks. So there's, there's, I think there's the scientific aspects and the health aspects of the clinical trials and all of that. There's also the business aspects and the intellectual property rights. So I think we're seeing all of those coming together um, and maybe layering over this and, and creating all kinds of issues that we're, we're all addressing right now. Yeah, and I'll be interested in what the professor has to say as well, but I, I think what's kind of unique in, in this circumstance, which we haven't had, at least to this degree, in other vaccines or, or treatments, is really the pooling of information. So, for example, you've got more than the top 20 pharma companies around the globe that now have kind of a centralized database where they're putting their research and development and clinical trial efforts in there to help deduplicate efforts to to identify risks in patient populations, to identify side effects, safety concerns. So if you've got J&J &J and, and GSK and BMS and Gilead and Sanofi and Novartis all pulling in their information, right, from all these clinical studies, and people can look at that in real time and say, okay, wow, this really appears to be a concern, that exchange of information, I don't believe has occurred at the level it's occurring now. And so I think that helps mitigate some of the safety concerns of the effectiveness or the time it would normally take to, to bring a vaccine. I do think it, it shortens that in a very positive way. And as Lisa was saying earlier, hopefully that collaboration and exchange of information can be used not only for COVID then, but also going forward. Hopefully we can cut down some of the time it takes to bring these, these types of treatments to mm -hmm. patients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Professor? So, Let's, let's talk a little bit about safety. Um, whenever you're developing a clinical, a clinical therapeutics, there are, there are acute and chronic safety considerations that you have to take into account. Um, acute means something that is immediate. Um, and every time you, you'll inject a foreign substance, and especially if this foreign substance is trying to elicit an immune response, you're gonna get at the very least flu-like symptoms um, and then the question is, how safe are they in, in, in a population that is at most at risk, right? So people over the age, for example, of 80, or people with cancer, or people with, with other complications and other diseases. So there's always a safety considerations that we have to take into account. Um, and, and there's a good chance that the vaccine being developed is not going to be for everybody. Um, so that's one. Number two, there is the long-term effects to consider. We, we really don't know. Uh, most vaccines didn't have significant, I'm going to be very cautious, <laughs> significant long-term effects. Um, you know, you can imagine, you know, allergies developing, you, may, you can imagine autoimmune effects being developed, uh, but most vaccines did not show that you know, developed over the last several hundreds of years. But on the other hand, we never had these powerful tools to elicit and maintain immune response. So we really don't know. And, and we are trying to balance uh, safety on one hand and, and return to normalcy on the other. Um, I, I think everybody realizes that, you know, we can't continue um, not having a vaccine and not protecting part of the population and continue with business as usual. Um, especially because even people that had COVID-19 seem to maintain antibody response for only several months. So uh, they can get reinfected and the first cases of reinfection are already emerging. So we have to have this long-term solution, especially when we think about, you know, the next pandemic. So this pandemic is going to die out. The problem is the coronaviruses are still with us. Now, if we were, would have been smart enough to develop a vaccine for SARS in 2002, we wouldn't be in this situation right now because a vaccine could have been slightly modified and it would have been better prepared. Uh, hopefully, we'll follow through this time and then the next pandemic will be easier to deal with. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Vera, do you want to start us off on 
uh, the discussion of intellectual property rights and how they factor into these research and development efforts? Sure, thanks, Charles. So, you know, IP is a, is a driver and, and really is the lifeblood, I think, of, of most life science companies. Um, it's always at the, the forefront of, you know, what's protecting a product, what, what drives the research and development dollars. Um, so, so it's very critical. And not only, you know, maybe patent protection or protection that you might get around a certain product, but also what you learn in the process of making that. So, you know, your, your know-how it would be called legally or your um, kind of trade secrets as to how to manufacture it, how to figure out how to, how to solve the problem, how to treat a patient. And, and that's very, very valuable. And so here, I think, you know, if I'm honest, I think there's a, a slight tension into companies all wanting to, to work to a common good. So for example, that um, R&D COVID Alliance um, yes. Cool. I was really struck by on their website, their, their slogan kind of, or what stands out is they have a win for one is a win for us all because the world is counting on us. So I think all these big companies right, recognize the world is counting on pharma and these life science companies to come up with a vaccine. At the same time, I, I think, again, there is this tension that companies do want to make sure that they are protecting um, all their efforts into not only um, coming up with a vaccine and treatments for COVID, but also that knowledge and that know-how that goes with how you would come up with a vaccine or um, an immunotherapy. Because what might work for COVID might work for other things that a company might want to capitalize in the future. And so I, IP, I think, continues to be very important. And while there is sharing of information, um, it, at least what I am aware of from some of our life science clients, they are being mindful of how they're defining the scope of what they're putting into these collaborative, collaborative efforts. So um, if they're putting in some trade secrets or know-how, how can they be used? Can they be used just to help develop a, a vaccine for COVID? Or can they be used more broadly for things outside of COVID and other Im immunotherapies? Again, I think that showcases, you know, the life science companies' realization that, that IP still is critical. Um, and, and IP is critical. So like our United States Patent Office has instituted what's called prioritized examination of, of patents. Um, to get a patent from the USPTO in a pharmaceutical case under regular examination can take you several years. Um, the Patent Office now has it basically that if you are doing an application related to COVID, you can try to get your patent within one year. So they will fast track that for you. Again, showing I think the importance of IP and the ability to obtain oh. patents and other intellectual property protections for your vaccine. Um, and interestingly, that I think the Patent Office also put together this platform, something like Partners for Patents, or it's all COVID related um, technologies. There's almost a thousand patents and applications in there that they or others have identified as potentially being relevant to either treating, curing, or dealing with the spread or preventing the spread of COVID. And so they've got this pool and you can go search by keywords and other things. And the idea is to get parties together so that they can further develop this intellectual property and come up with, again, treatments or, or cures or ways to stop the disease. So IP is definitely, definitely at the forefront, I believe, um, of coming up with, with a vaccine and treatments. Yes, so Beer, I would say that that is um, such an important point that you are highlighting this balance between kind of the public and the private. So I think the advent of coronavirus has just highlighted to us that this particular industry in life sciences um, more so than other industries, you have that balance um, and you have those two competing interests of getting drugs to the, to the public at, uh, in, in an economic uh, manner such that you know, people can afford these drugs um, and that they're uh, widely available. And at the same time, I think we all appreciate that uh, the reason that we have been able to jump into this area and uh, finding 
treatments and, and vaccines for, for COVID is because of the IP system that we have in place. So it, it in many ways spurs um, innovation. Uh, so you have on this one hand, this idea that that because there has been a strong IP system in place, that um, creates research and development funds that companies have in order to really have this great platform to start with in, in looking for um, COVID treatments. Um, at the same time, we have this tremendous public interest in making sure that whatever comes out of that is available. Um, and we, we can have the, the population uh, have access to to the vaccine. So I think in many ways, this always exists in life sciences, but uh, COVID again has kind of highlighted this and you see a lot of interest in patent pooling or licensing like uh, the, this open COVID pledge. Uh, and licensing in many ways is a great way to deal with this because in that way companies can protect the IP that they're developing in looking for COVID vaccines and, and treatments. Because of course, as we know, many of the developments that come out of that may be applicable to other areas. And companies want, of course, secure IP rights to that. But finding creative ways to license that and make it available either, for instance, royalty free to research institutions and universities so that they can use IP to develop um, further in this area or to have licenses that are available perhaps more widely, at least during this time when we're battling um, COVID. So there's definitely, I think, uh, um, a real kind of um, tension in many ways, but a lot of creative ideas are coming out of this balance of kind of public and private. Mm -hmm. How can we, um... How can the public be reassured that things are not happening too quickly and not safely enough? Um, everyone reads that it takes years and years, and the professor said this, and others you know, have said this, in the ordinary course to develop a vaccine. And here we're doing it in one-tenth the time or you know, even less. So you, you read uh, about these um, interviews and with people and polls with people who say that even if there is a vaccine, I will not take it because it seems that it has been developed too quickly and I'm not sure um, you know, it is safe enough. Um, so I know that's not strictly an answer mm -hmm. uh, for you, and maybe the professor will weigh in on this as well. But, but, but that is what we're hearing and seeing, it, you know, in the media. Mm -hmm. So it's it's important to point out that you know for the past, I would say almost sixty years, the, the U.S. had probably one of the best agencies in the world to protect the public. And, and to protect and maintain the public trust when it comes to drug development. Um, this includes vaccine development. So the FDA is, um, has its finger on the pulse during the entire development course, and it's looking closely at the development. And, and actually, there's a lot of people to trust there. Um, I don't think anything will be approved without a proper phase three, you know, uh, blinded study. And, and once, it gets, once it gets approved, there are several years of monitoring of, of these type of therapies um, and they can be black labeled or removed at any point of time if, if we're tracking the patients and we see something is going wrong. So the, the regulation is there. Now, I, I totally agree that the political spectrum in, um, in the US is somewhat of a challenge when it comes to vaccine development and, and vaccine, um, um, I would say, rollout. But the rest of the world, I think there's, you're going to see a lot less resistance to a vaccine once it's approved and released. 
um, the nature of the discourse has, has become political. So uh, this is where, you know, science is completely irrelevant. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, the other thing people wonder and worry about is when will there be enough? Right, um, you know, um, how quickly can these companies ramp up and make, uh, you know, millions, hundreds of millions uh, of doses so that, because COVID is all over the world now, it's not just in one place. So, you know, from, from an engineering perspective, I don't think we have a major concern. Um, if, if it was, if we we're limited to protein-based vaccines, maybe that would have been an, a major issue because you need a significant amount of protein to elicit an immune response. But the modern type of uh, vaccines are, you know, both the, the, the ones that rely on genetic material, like the one that Moderna is developing, which is a nucleic acid vaccine, or the viral vector vaccines can be generated in, in, in massive amounts in relatively few bioreactors and in, you know, in, 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 in what we have today. So I think we'll be fine, uh, especially when it comes to 2021, I think we'll be covered, you know, initially probably the, the populations covered are gonna be the caregivers and mm -hmm. after that, the, the elderly population and, and the population at risk, but then the entire population if necessary. Um, this, will come probably at the same time as, as drug repurposing takes place. And I would love to hear your insights on that. You know, drug repurposing, I think we will have some drugs that are not hydrochloroquine that are effective clinically. Um, and, and, and they will come at, at pro, you know, just like dexamethasone is very effective. Uh, and they will come even sooner than a vaccine. So there's probably going to be multiple lines of protection here. You know, a drug you can take when you just get symptoms, a drug you can take like an antiviral or an anti-inflammatory, you know, at the later stage of disease and a vaccine, you know, protecting the, um, the, the extreme populations. So there's going to be multiple lines of treatments. We, we are not putting all our eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so just to follow up, Professor, um, on, on your point about um, drug repurposing, I think that this, you know, that, that's something really kind of at this intersection of, you know, looking for the treatment and, and IP issues, um, something that perhaps, again, has kind of had some new focus because of coronavirus. Obviously, we see it in the past, um, the thought of many of these drugs that are even off patent, um, having a lack of interest or maybe a lack of funding that's available to really look at these drugs for repurposing and spending the money on clinical trials and all of that. So I do think that's an area, again, where there's this kind of the intersection with IP rights um, that we have increased interest in, certainly in repurposing, uh, certainly uh, increased flow of funds to look at um, these particular um, drugs. And I'm, and I'm sure that some of the companies that are exploring this are at the same time exploring if there's a, a, some type of intellectual property rights that can come out of that repurposing. Because as, as we said, that in many ways is what keeps all of the R&D kind of flowing um, and, and moving along this idea of being able to somehow um, get them right, um, monetize this. I mean, that, that's always part of it. But I think what we're seeing at this point in time is there's just such an interest to find treatments, um, to, to find a vaccine in order to kind of get all of our economies going again, uh, that, that there's certainly a lot more flexibility um, and, and focus, I think, in, in terms of just kind of getting it out there. And if is something is found to be successful, whether it's repurposing or a new drug treatment, um, there's just so much international focus, I think, to get enough made so that it will be available to the world uh, mm -hmm. population, that this is kind of where we have just all of these resources coming together. Uh, I think maybe perhaps one of the IP issues that flows from that 
is the idea of licensing. I know a lot of companies are thinking about things like compulsory licensing. Um, we have here in the U.S. this idea of margin rights from uh, Baidu, uh, th this thought that um, will companies have a fear that, uh, you know, within certain countries, perhaps, uh, I know, for instance, Canada has put some laws into effect, um, allowing kind of the government to jump in and produce and kind of sell any patented uh, invention with the thought that just to make sure that enough gets out there for the population. I know France also has some compulsory licensing laws they put in a place where it says that it, it, they can um, create and, and make certain drugs and that they can even launch a generic uh, product before patent expiry. So I think there's um, different thoughts probably around the globe to, to make sure um, a, a certain amount of these drugs will be available to the population. I know, Vera, that's something, certainly we, we like buy Dole and Marchin rights, things that we think of quite often uh, when we're putting together collaboration. Yeah, that's absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Because everyone wants to make sure, I mean, if you're entering into a license agreement that you know what you can and can't do, and if the government can come in and change what you can or can't do, I mean, everyone wants to have a good feel for that. Uh, and I think, Lisa, you're absolutely right on the, on the drug repurposing in, in Professor 2. You know, there is somewhat of a tension there, I think, because what can you do from an IP perspective to, to protect those drugs is on the one hand, um, although I think that there are things that you can do. So if you, or it turns out that you really can take some of these older drugs off the shelf, and figure out the right amount to give to give the right result, result for for a new treatment. I mean that that is potentially um, protectable IP, and so I do think companies are looking at that. Um, just because you take an old drug doesn't mean that you necessarily can't get any IP protection around that. Um, not for the compound itself, but the formulation of it, the way you use it. Um, those can all be things that can be protected as well as if you take an old drug and maybe combine it with something else or something new, those combinations could be patent protectable. Mm -hmm. And another potential benefit of actually a repurposed drug is you don't have to worry that maybe somebody else already has that, that IP covered. So some of these new therapies, right, especially um, you know, the antivirals, the, the protein-based therapies, there's a lot of IP only around you know, end results but also the processes uh, that are involved there. And so if you really can take an old compound that's been in existence for, for quite a while, that's not covered by any IP, in, in some ways there's a benefit there because you don't have to worry if you have to go out and get a license to further develop your mm -hmm. um, vaccine or technology because it's already out in the public domain. So I think there's gonna be kind of a balancing act when people look at you know, ways to repurpose drugs, definitely pros and cons on each side to potentially finding something that, that could work there. Mm -hmm. And I think what you said about monetizing it also comes into play very interestingly. So, so you know, we, we keep forgetting, and I, I, I do that myself, that patents are a sword, not a shield, right? And, and it's, it's, it's important to, to point out, even if you do have a patent uh, and a valid claim on, on, on the use of a specific drug for a certain treatment, nothing pre prevents physicians from prescribing those drugs to their patients if they think that there is solid scientific evidence to support it. Um, so, so monetization is, is, always a, is always a concern there when you're doing drug repurposing, um, especially if you're not changing the indication for the initial drugs. Um, and that might raise problems, for example, if you're trying to put together a clinical study because there are few companies that are willing to invest the money which comes up to about half a million to a million dollars in a clinical study proving the efficacy of a drug that they won't be able to defend uh, or they won't be able to, to, to prevent physicians from just you know, subscribing to their patients. So that's always a concern and it's one of those things that, that might delay progress just in the way that it, it you know, uh, encourages innovation. I think that's very, very, very true. And um, 
I think as we're as we were saying, this is um, perhaps you know during this this period where we're looking for COVID treatments, um, that that's kind of so much at the forefront. And I think that uh, you know one thing we've been seeing is uh, because everything is kind of on this accelerated timeline. You know, how do we address a lot of these IP issues? Uh, how do we think about them um, in putting together these collaborations? Uh, because there is so much interest in, will I be able to protect this um, you know, in, into the future, particularly if I have something um, that has value? So you know, there's, uh, for instance, patents that may cover a drug. There's patents, for instance, uh, that, that may cover a platform. So the professor mentioned earlier, uh, one of the types of the vaccines we're using, the viral vectors like an adenovirus, um, those have been used now for uh, decades uh, in, in many different areas, um, other uh, uh, Ebola and HIV. And so you're, you're kind of building off that research and there's, there's certain patents on uh, certain platforms, let's say, that will have value to companies beyond just um, coronavirus. So I think this is where uh, we're looking at, at the collaborations and thinking about what do the different companies bring to that collaboration, who's bringing in background IP that they've already developed, or maybe even things that are in the public sector, uh, and then what do you develop off of that, the collaboration or oftentimes kind of we'll call the forefront, the, the IP that develops out of that collaboration. So a, a lot of different IP issues like that will come up and companies will be thinking about how do we define this? Who owns what in this collaboration? Uh, what did I bring to it? What comes out of it? How do we make the best use of that? Who owns it? How do we perhaps license it together if we both have rights in it or we both contributed to it um, how do we protect it how do we prosecute it i know vera you've you've done a lot um in that in that area dealing with this uh kind of joint ip rights um and how companies kind of parse that out and and handle that yeah and that's always yeah mm -hmm. i mean an area of, of tension right because mm -hmm at least in the US, joint owners of IP can each go out and do whatever they want with the IP. So if Lisa and I both jointly mm -hmm. own a patent, Lisa can take that patent and go license it to whomever she wants and she doesn't have to account to me. And I can go license it to whoever I want and not account to her. Um, and so, you know, if we're partners, I don't know that I actually want her to be able to do that, right? Mm -hmm. We want to be able to come to some type of understanding as to how that's gonna look whether we stay together or whether we, you know, break apart later. And so the, the ownership of joint IP and what you do with it, I mean, that is kind of a, a trap um, to, to watch out for in the start of a agreement. And to the extent you can define what's going to happen early on, the better. So we might say, for example, yeah, we can each go take in the IP and do what we want and we're okay with that. That's our understanding. Or we might say, okay, you know what, Lisa, um, why don't you take the jurisdictions of the U.S. and Europe, and I'm going to take mm -hmm. Asia and the Middle East and Australia, right? We're going we're gonna to somehow divide the world by jurisdictions um, because you're more prominent in, in the U.S. and Europe, and I'm more prominent in, in other jurisdictions. And so that's the way we're going to divide the joint IP. Or we might say, okay, um, I'm going to take the joint IP, and I can use it for COVID-related purposes, and Lisa, you can use it for anything else. Um, and so again, thinking about how you want to deal and handle with that, that joint IP early on is, is really critical. One thing else to think about, if you are gonna divide the IP, um, either by subject matter, so different, you know, I, I take COVID, she takes everything else, or by jurisdictions, you do want continuity in the IP overall. Uh, and by that, I mean, when you're going to prosecute your patents around the globe, you wanna make sure that one partner isn't doing something to negatively affect the rights of the other, saying other things. So, so also kind of on the outset, you wanna have a communication plan 
for how are you going to go out and get those patents? And how often do you have to communicate with each other? And what do you have to do before time to make sure somebody's not saying something in Europe that can work against them in the, in the United States or Israel or other locations? Um, so that's, that's definitely something to think about. Israel also has a duty of disclosure, just like we do in the United States. And so if there's something that would be important to your patent that a patent examiner needs to know, in the US, you have to tell them about it. In Israel, you do too. So again, you want to make sure that you've got that communication between the parties or your, your development partners to make sure that whatever IP you do develop together is, is strong and can be used as that sword in the future. And not that it could be easily subject to an attack just because there wasn't the proper communication or exchange of information. Thank you. So any, any last thoughts before I turn it over to Jody to wrap up? Professor or um, Lisa? Uh, yeah, I would, I would just add, I think, you know, in terms of, of, of wrap up that this is uh, such an interesting area, this intersection of kind of COVID um, and all the, the vaccines, the treatments um, that the world's developing, uh, this intersection with IP. I think we're going to see tremendous things come out of it. And I think this combination of kind of the scientists with uh, you know, lawyers and IP rights, there's going to be so much learned from this that's applicable in just kind of generally immunotherapy as we kind of move on. I think we're, we're almost uh, entering kind of a, a, a time of increased research development and collaboration. I think some incredible things will see likely come out of this. Well, thank you very mm -hmm. much, Lisa and mm -hmm. Vera, my partners, and uh, Kobe, as always. Um, thank you for a terrific presentation. And Jody, I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Jody Perlma from the American Friends of the Hebrew University, and I'm incredibly honored to represent the prestigious Hebrew University of Jerusalem. It's one of the world's most distinguished academic and research institutions. On behalf of Nexus Israel and the American Friends of the Hebrew University, thank you, Kobe. Vera, Lisa, and Phyllis, all of you, for your very insightful dialogue. And thank you to everyone at Mayor Brown for their partnership and sponsorship of Nexus Israel. For everyone that's still listening, we hope you will, <clears throat> excuse me, participate in future events like this. You can find them all on the AFHU and Nexus Israel websites. If you like what you heard, please consider serving as an ambassador to help improve our visibility. You can follow us uh, and Nexus Israel on LinkedIn and Facebook and other social media. And of course, we always welcome the financial support for the incredible work of Hebrew University's faculty and students. Uh, please be in touch with me directly if you want to learn more and be sure to check out www.nexusisrael.org. And thank you everyone again for being with us. Okay, thank you. And I think we've answered any questions but if you still have any, send them to Jody or send them to me, and uh, we'd be happy to try to get them answered. Have, have a great rest of the day, and Shana Tova. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.